Hello, everybody. Steve Buck with Dixon Drums here today with two legendary drummers, Mr. Greg Bissonette, and introducing to the Dixon roster. Stan, hello. Hi. <laughs> I love it. Hey, okay. I'm so excited, Steve, and I and Jim. That Stan Lynch, my buddy of so many years, one of my hero drummers and best pals, is on the Dixon team with us. Stan, welcome to the team, buddy. Thank you very much for having me, fellas. I really mean it. I'm really touched. You guys, uh, I can almost get right to it. I can't resist. I, I don't want to bury the lead. Go. Go for it. Please take a look at this drum set that was made for me, designed by Greg Bissonette, all to spec. It is a gorgeous kit in a Tupelo honey, similar to a old thermogloss that we had back in the day that was um, sort of the Ringo rooftop and Bonzo, you know, early. That was big for all of us, I'm sure. That, but, but I happened to have an old thermogloss when I was a kid that, like all of us, you know, we, we lost them to the ether somewhere. But this kit has been fantastic. I've just received it recently, and um, it's by far and away, and I'm it, it, no BS, it is truly the best drum set I've ever owned. And it is really yeah. remarkable. Yeah. So thank, thank you all for the effort. I know it was a global effort to pull it together during the pandemic to make this happen. And uh, it's it's been really, a, it's been a game changer for me. I really enjoyed every second of it. That's great. How'd you first hear about Dixon drums? Was it through Greg or how'd that even come about? I, literally, I think I heard them when Greg played them. And um, we started talking about them and uh, I had a, really I haven't had a new drum set in probably 40 years. Um, the last kit I was playing was when I was a Tom and Dorsey back way back in the day with Tom. And um, I had an old set of Imperial stars that I'd hang, hung on to for pretty much for sentimental reasons. And, uh, and I, Greg and I both had an old, we both share the you know love of the old vintage Ludwig stuff and the Ringo sets and, so I had a couple, I have a super classic and a club date uh, that were both, I really loved playing them. And we got to talking, I was just talking about drum sounds and and it came right on the heels of my, uh, we both share a friend in uh, Rob Jacobs, who's a highly well, you know, really well-respected engineer out in California. And we were talking and I was talking about Greg because we've been working remotely, you know, during COVID, we've all been sending files and I've been sending my old Ludwig files and, and uh, uh, it was, Rob Jacobs, who said, you know, I was just over recording with Greg the other day, and we moved some microphones from an, another brand over to his kit. And he said, Lynch, you're not going to believe just the A and B of just moving microphones from one drum set to another. He goes, was extraordinary. So I get that little tidbit and come from Rob. I kind of went, yeah, whatever, fine. You know, I didn't really, I didn't put it all together. And then Greg said, you know, yeah, did you, did you hear from uh, Rob the other day when he was over recording? I go, then the nickel starts to drop. And he, and I said something like, you know, I, my drum sets were a little, my sounds were a little anemic that I've been giving Rob remotely. And then he, then I, and I was just asking him, I said, you know, look, I'm reaching out, trying to, you know, I'm God forbid thinking of actually buying a new drum set. You know, I haven't, where do you go? What do you look for? And Greg said, you know, well, Hey, let me, send you some sound files. Let me just show you what I'm getting out of this four piece, which is another whole story for Greg and I talking about four piece drum sets. Cause when I met Greg, he had 5,000 drums. And I told him, I said, one day, I swear, I got a vision of you. You're going to be playing a four piece kit. And uh, I said that to you, Greg. I know I, you came in my house in Woodland Hills and then you saw my vintage, you know, early sixties Ringo kit and you went, Yes, there's hope for you. I you love four piece kids. I said, I love Ringo. He's my favorite drummer. And you said, me too. And we both said Ringo and Bonham. And because I think you saw that I had that vintage Ringo kit and I had a Beatle tribute band, you went, all right, man, you're on the right path. Well, I just seen him the night before playing with, you know, DLR at the forum with this monster drum set. And he's playing, you know, look, the man needs no introduction about the chops. It's like, and with, with David Lee, it was so like full horsepower all the time. I mean, everything just, you know, 
ballistic. Greg, I mean, it was an amazing show. And Greg's like literally climbing on top of drums. He's playing drums with one hand behind his back. He's, you know, he's got, it's, it's all going on. I'm thinking, well, that's drumming. Then I don't know what I'm doing, but, it, but so I figured we, I figured we'd, we probably have nothing in common. So it was when we were back at Greg's place and we were talking and, I, and we were, I, I saw this little drum set and Greg goes, yeah, that's my heart, man. He goes, that's where I, that's where I actually live. I'm that's right. like, I was like, man, one day I know we're, you know, if, so that's, we, we both ended up pretty much in the same place. And then Greg was telling me about his Dixon drums. He was saying, look, they're, they're already making a kick drum that's deeper, which I'm such an old school guy. I'm still 14 by 24 or 14 by 22. Greg's going, no, no, they got an 18, you know, cause I'm already thinking tunnels and I'm thinking, how do you bring like the old days with Jonas and yeah. how do I, and he's like, no, 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 we've already thought this through. We've already got this figured out. And, and I'm like, go and tell me more. And then, uh, yeah. and so he's just, he, he literally took me right through his sizes, you know, the, the little deeper on the 12, because I was an eight by 12 guy. I'm a super traditional. He's going, no, nah, you really want to, because you can do it, but he goes, you're going to, you'll thank me, you know, get the 10. He's right. You know, get the 24. I was already thinking that's too much bass drum for me right now. And he's like, no, 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 you're going to love it. And the way they hang the Tom now, it's going to, I don't know if you can tell this one, I've got mine, no mounts. So it's all, I get a virgin kick. And uh, yeah. so it's like, I can bring mine. And that, that mount is insanely simple and clean. That's the thing. I mean, I I don't even know what I was thinking, you know, with the old consulates and you know, it's like I can see why Charlie's always got his in a basket, you know, because you. But this is very clean and really well designed. The drum speaks so loud. I mean, it's. I'm not even putting any muffling on mine yet. I haven't even done that. I'm like, I just love to hear them all howling. You know, it's like everything going. Just I love everything about it. I've got. I invested in a real nice set of the legacy 67s so I can put use the kind of the Glen Johns, the overheads and keep a very live kit, which in the headphones makes you play the drums as you wish they would be recorded. You know, it's like, I don't have an engineer filter trying to make the Tom Tom too loud. I'm the guy who has to bring it out or right. and I love that. I love having a live kit to do that with. That's what I always loved. And that's what right. these, it's extraordinary. It's just great. But Greg is the one who walked me into Dixon by sharing the files with me. And then he said, well, let us see if we can't build you a kit. And then you guys were so gracious to even ask me what I, how you wanted him to look, which was like, that's too much. That's really too much. That's like, you know, would you like your eyes shaved or a, a large scotch cube? You know, <laughs> One of the cool <laughs> things too, Stan, is that you're playing your drums, your Tupelo Honey drums, are thin maple they're your tupelo honey and they're artisan they're artisan and the drums that i my signature my drums that i use the ones you saw with ringo those are artisan but the drums that rob jacobs heard that's the cornerstone line and wow so you, you can jump in and talk about how the cornerstone is a it, it, it's not an entry level kit but it's it's not as, as as expensive let's say or as you know whatever as the artisan but yet they sound so great to me. It doesn't, I do clinics. I do things. They say, well, what line do you have to play? I said, as long as they're Dixon, I am there. Can you tell the listeners out here about the cornerstone and how, you know, Rob was blown away with that. And then we got Stan into the artist. Yeah. The uh, cornerstone series that you're talking about is our mid-level kit. It's a mid professional kit um, made out of red silk wood and maple. And we also have a maple version of that kit out right now um five piece configurations um i use one of those myself and i get compliments on the bass drum especially all the time and the tom tom aren't you gigging tonight with that kid i am where's wow. your gig Where, what are you playing <laughs> i'm playing uh my glam rock band tonight what song are you doing so bowie yeah we're doing bowie t-rex sweet um who else are we doing um you wouldn't believe it we're actually covering the osmonds tonight we're doing crazy horses and Crazy horses! Wow! Wow! Oh. Man, that's so good. So that's that's a fun thing we're doing. Um, but all that stuff, and the guys dress up crazy, and it's a lot. It's a blast. And so what kit are you using tonight? Uh, the Cornerstone. The, ma the maple ones you're talking about? I have the hybrid myself. I got the first edition of those, and those are fantastic drums. 
So Stan, isn't that cool that the kit that Rob was loving was the mid-level kit, and now and you've no got idea. the top-level kit. You know? Nobody knows it's a mid-level kit. I've taken it out and I showed it to drummers, and they they play it. They go, "Man, what's this cost? About three thousand bucks?" I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> Try about a third of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's fantastic. I love it. I also play that in the ELO band I'm in. Are you doing a whole ELO set? Yeah, we've we've done several. I mean, we we do an hour and a half show. We're actually doing the whole Discovery album coming up in October. Yeah, it's a ten piece band. Can you send us some YouTube clips of that? I want to yeah, hear that. Absolutely. Yeah. Your Bev Bevan. Yeah. Wait, what, what what's your stage name? Is it like Bev Bunked Bevan? <laughs> We we're trying to come up with one. Yeah, we haven't settled on one. <laughs> Dan, can you tell us about that really cool band you have right now where you guys do those videos and you do stuff remotely? But I know Andy Timmons played guitar on one of them. Yeah, I got, well, I actually got a couple quarantine bands right now that are pretty good there. Uh, I've got this one called The Speaker Wars, which is my, my buddy out in uh, Texas. Then I'm working on a band. I don't know if you all remember a, a band called The Georgia Satellites. Yeah, you, you um, let me sit in on one of your things with the producer. Yeah, right. The um, the uh, at the Captain and Tennille studio, Rumbo. That's right. Oh, what's the um, guy's name? Uh, the big he Dan him. Dan Baird is the singer from the Satellites, and we have a band called the Chefs, and um, it's it's pretty. We're we're working on our second album, and uh, it's it's pretty. It's really fun. It's hard, you know, making quarantine records. It's, um, you know, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge, especially because I, I have to work alone. You know, it's like, and I live, I've been practicing social distancing now for about 30 years anyway. So it's, it's not that hard for me, but it's still difficult when you want that. I, I love being in a room with other musicians. The energy is unbelievable. And plus the instant reaction. You know, if, if you get fart face from a bass player, you know, you're on the wrong track. You know, <laughs> yeah. but if you get if you get the instant like the the shoulder goes up and you kind of go like, well, you know that you're. I love the unspoken truth that happens between musicians at a live session where you just, you know, you you can just tell like when the guitar player's not digging your chili, they kind of turn your back and they're a little disinterested. You go, oh, I ain't got him yet. But when he's kind of puts his kind of leans into your bass drum a little and gives you the look, you go. Oh man, I live for the love. You know, it's like right. thank you. You know, it's like then you know you're, and and unlike well, Greg can can actually define a chart and read a chart and tell you what what I have to do. I have to go by purely antenna. You know, I so it's always a delayed reaction. I'm sending files, waiting two days. You know, and then somebody calls me back and goes, Oh yeah, yeah, you you nailed the bridge. You know, and it's like, yeah. Oh, that would have been really helpful to know two days ago. You know, so. I um I, I really miss that, but the what's been really fun immediately working on some of this remote stuff is the immediate difference in sending the the, the files with this kit. It was like night and day when the engineer put them up. He just went like, "Oh, something's changed." You know what I mean? It's like I sent the picture and he went, "Right." <laughs> you know, so it was really nice that you guys brought me into the the correct millennium. You know, it's like you really did. You, 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 you know, the you teaching an old dog a new trick is really a beautiful thing, and it's uh, it's just been great. I don't even. I, I you were talking too about uh, just on these drums too. There was a thing about in the old Ludwig's they had the, the like they weren't the retaining ring, but they were the what was the ring that kept them reinforcing hoops. There is none of this in this. It's like straight shotgun barrel, and exactly. it's like. And when I when I was when I unpacked them and I you know I reheaded them to Greg Spec, you know, and it was like you know the clear and clear and, and uh, white coated. When I had them, when I had the drums just dry and I was looking at them, I didn't you know the bearing edges are cut so beautifully tight and everything's the tolerances were just extraordinary. I'd never experienced that as you can imagine with the older drums. I'm like you're kind of like licking the you know making shoot maybe a little three in one head i can get these this head to seat right you do this down and just you push down on the on the on the rims and they they seated immediately you just heard the the glue crack and you just went it's like oh we're done it's like and stan one of the greatest things because steve i don't know do you know that steve do you know the name jeff chonis yeah i've talked to jeff many times yeah okay good because stan and i have used jeff forever 
Uh, he's the drum tech in Ringo's All-Star Band. He's been Ringo's tech since the All-Star Band started in 89. My dad was always my tech for in-town stuff. But when I toured with Ringo and Stan, always used, uh, and I believe so did Don Henley, um, with Stan, Jeff's company, Drum Paradise. And when, when Jeff gave the thumbs up, the two thumbs up on the yeah. Dixon drums, that was all, you know, that was like the blessing of blessings, man. It is. No, Greg goes all the way back. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Jeff, he was my first guy. I mean, I was doing my own carnage up until the third Petty album. And I ran into Chonas one day in the studio it never occurred to me. We were so unsophisticated. Like I was packing my drums up and bringing back to my apartment. Really? You know? Oh yeah. You know, I just never occurred to me like, Oh, I don't know how other guys do it. And, um, and Jonas said, you know, Hey man, I could, um, I might be able to help you out. You know, it was so sweet. And he took the kit and he made fly cases for him. And he, he said, you know, it really is going to work out for you. If you do a little bit of work, you know, I, I make my, Skrilla, you do your thing. And he goes, you can, I can, I can take this burden from you. And I remember it took, he, he'll tell you, it took two years for me to, my OCD wouldn't even allow him. To, like I, I'd almost have to drive back to Drum Paradise with my kit. Really? Oh yes. Make sure that they were packed correctly. Really? Sure that every, oh yeah. I was so uptight. My drums is, is, it's, I've never been one of those whatever guys about yeah. my drums. It's never That's been a like a thing. That's prediction right there. Oh, yeah. Well, I've never been able to just like, you know, go like, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. Even when we were ordering the kit, I was like, you know, I won't say suspicious. I was just so curious. I'm like, curious. well, are they going to have this? Are they going to have that? Is it going to be this? And, and Greg was just like going, let it go. You're going to like, and then it was finally, I remember kind of at some point trying to go on like, Hey, have we been introduced? It's like you're talking to you're talking to GB here. Like if it's this is you know I'm like let go, like let go. Get you're gonna, and uh, but yeah, every exceeds what I could. I I'm literally I'm you know me I'm pulling parts of I'm going wow everything's insulated and isolated. And I'm pulling bass drum claws going. I've never seen this. You know I've never. I'm I was I was amazed at the detail that so went Stan, in. Stan, I gotta ask you just because I've known you. Since our great friend Myron Grombacher introduced us, probably yeah. in 87 or something. But, you know, one of the times I went, Steve, to, to Stan's home that he had here in, south of the boulevard in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, um, I saw this amazing redwood deck. And I talked to Stan about the deck. And he's going, yeah, you can build this, you know, and you, all you got to do this, you can have somebody build it. And then he had this amazing lifestyle spa. He said, I've checked them all out. You don't want the gas. You don't want this. <laughs> to heat up. You want this thing. It's electric. It runs on 110. I had the Stan Lynch approved deck in <laughs> within six months. I had, and I still keep buying lifestyle spas because they're the best. And Stan, did this all come from, as a kid in St. Augustine, were you into cars? Were you into just techie kind of construction building? How did this all come about with you? Necessity, ne total necessity. I mean, we were, um, I mean, you know, I didn't know it, but we were broke. You know what I mean? I didn't know it back then. Cause you know, and you, you, what, you, everybody was probably broke. All my friends were broke. You know, right. it was like, so if you wanted something nice you sort of had to create it or save up and get like nobody bought a drum set you bought a drum you know and then you tried to find a drum that would match that would be so all my life has been sort of on i didn't know it but i was doing uh, ethnographic field work you know wow. like, it's like you know my whole life has been you know like learning about amplifiers and microphones just by like there's got to be something better than a 57 and it's like well not really for a snare drum but like let's you know so you it's, I, we've always been, I think we were, maybe it's the generation or maybe, I don't know, but we were very hands-on, you know. You old uh, cars and fixing your car and. Well, not even old cars, just fix whatever car would you get. You know, right. like, there's your car. Fix. Try to keep it running, you know, like, there's your amp, you know, there's your PA, you know, like, try not to blow it up. And it's, a, it, it was really wonderful, hands-on. So, like, I think that there's this, there is truth to, like I said, I, I was, uh, it was Christmas morning unpacking this kit for me. I, it, it never worn off. The, the th thought of something new and good is still very, very exciting. You know, it's like, I, it's not wasted on me. I'm not blase. That's great to hear. 
Um, I want to ask you about um, both of you. Like, well, I know Greg's biggest influence is Ringo um, as a drummer. And Stan, you and I had talked previously a while ago about your, your upbringing as a musician. You actually started as a guitar player and then became a drummer, if I'm not mistaken, right? I took a lot of guitar lessons. I took violin lessons and trumpet lessons. And I, I took all this stuff and basically washed out. And then I was in the school band and finally the band leader in a last ditch attempt when I think they put me on third chair trumpet, said like, have you considered drums? But I, but I had already taken, I was 11 years old. I, I took my first drum lessons. We were still living in Miami. And uh, I got, I got kind of lucky. He was a drummer. He was a, um, in a kind of in a big band. Wait and, a minute, wait a minute. You didn't grow up in St. Augustine. You grew up in Miami originally? Well, we lived in my, we, my, my father, my, my parents were educators. And um, one would always come to U of F to, to get a degree while the other one got a job and they would tag team each other so they could, one, my dad got a PhD and my mom got a master's so they could sort of work their way up the food chain in the educational world. And um, as a result, we would move between Miami and Gainesville pretty often. Gainesville. Gainesville. So who was your teacher in Miami? What was the cat's name? Sonny, and I'm trying to remember his last name, but the guy in Gainesville who really brought me to the game was a guy named Gene Bardot. He's the guy who got me my, my nard card and taught me my rudiments. And he was the one who like, he had a beautiful drum kit in the corner that I wasn't allowed to even touch for about two years. I kept looking at his red sparkle club date going, Gene, when do I get to play? And he goes, when you learn all your rudiments. Wow. He goes, you always talk about NARD, you know, the, uh, the Nard book, you know, the Wilcox and all this. You and I have talked a lot about getting your diploma from the National Association of Rudimentary. Hang on, I'm glad you mentioned it. What Look at that? that. Wait. Wait for it. Wait a I minute. Want to Wait meet, a I want to meet your drum teacher's sister, Bridget. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, if you act now. If you act now. Whoa, tell us about that. That's my Nard, that's my Nard diploma. That's amazing. It uh, says to Stan Lynch Jr., 1968, from Gene Bardot. This tells me that I have been fully examined and I am a real drummer. Right here. <laughs> I don't know anybody on. else that has one of those. That's so cool. It hangs on my wall. I still have my Nard card, which I just dropped somewhere. I don't know where I brought it out. You're a card-carrying Nard member. I'm a Nard. I have my Nard for my wallet card. I was very proud of that. And I still, I, obviously, I still have it. I hang it. I have got it hanging on my wall. It's a, but the, yeah, the Nard thing was really, it was a 13 essential 26. And um, I had to learn them all and, and to a BPM. And I sat on that practice pad for two years. My dad would go drink a beer and get paid my $3 lesson with Gene. And um, it was great, man. I, I hated every second of it, but it was like, because because it was the same, at one point he would say like, you know, you'd walk in and you'd go like, okay, let's try your double paradiddles. And it'd be like, you didn't practice last week, did you? And it'd be like, mm, yeah, well, you didn't practice. It'd be like, so it was, you know, when you're 13 years old and the guy's calling, calling muster on you and he's good. And he was a heavy set guy, he was a percussionist. You know, he had a marimba in his house and he played. He was, and when I remember telling him, when I finally got my 26 rudiments up to speed, he said something like, I said, you know, now can I play the drum set? And he, th this was what broke my heart. He said, I really expected more from you. I was hoping you would want to be a percussionist, but if you want to be a drummer, I think I've taught you all I can. Oh my gosh, I'm glad you didn't turn into, there's not a lot of marimba in, in the Tom Petty band. But I can understand where he was coming from. He was coming from a purely like symphonic, I was hoping you were really going to be, embrace the percussionist life like and all that that implies like you know but i i just hey i'd already seen the beatles game over game over man you know game over the stones had already played the sullivan the kinks had already played sullivan it's like i'm already pulling my one hair over my ear and i i got the cool boots and i'm already looking for the chicks and let's get out of here you know Amen. what i mean so um and plus, you know, I'm, I'm running with guys five years older than me already. And they're like, let's go. You know, like we're not looking back. They're, the, the B plan is starvation and death. You Who know? are those guys, the five-year-older guys? Well, they, you know, we series of bar bands. But I really only had one professional. Well, there were two, a couple. There was actually a, a gigging band 
in, in Gainesville where we had the Dickies and the, you know, the whole bit and we played Chicago medleys and, and all that. There was one, there was an actual show band that was a like job. Chicago, like 25 or six to four. Yeah. Yeah. We had to learn medleys and we, we you know, there's Santana medleys and the yeah. whole bit. And uh, that was a band that actually would tour, you know, would, would, went on the road and, and I made enough money to buy my first thermogloss real kit, you know, probably I'm guessing that those three shells were probably 800 bucks at the time, which is in high school was insane amount of money, you know? Um, so, and then pretty much from there, I, I met the guys that, you know, would pretty much become like the, the, the petty guys, the heartbreaker guys. I started running into them and they were a little, they were a little older and they were already on their way out to California. So I was coattailing pretty quick, you know, as soon as, as soon as I could get up, you know, some form of high school diploma, you know, I'll be seeing you guys as soon as possible, you know? Beautiful. So. How did you actually uh, apply, did you end up applying any of that stuff that Gene showed you into your drum set playing? I know you stuck with the, tradi the traditional grip and uh, I don't ever, I don't remember ever seeing you play match grip. Is, is that just a stylistic choice or what feels best for you? I would play match grip when I, mostly in a panic. Like when I, early in life, I would get the claw, you know, from like, you know, you play too hard or you overplay your hand, you know, you, you, you know, it took me years to realize that there was a PA and it took me years to realize that I couldn't, I, I couldn't, couldn't play from here, you know? So it like, I would get this horrible, or I panic. I think we were like, you know, having to play, what was that TV show? Um, Midnight Special or one of those? Old Man Jack? Yes, yeah, exactly. That, right, he came out and, it, right. And this is probably 1977 and I'm still a kid and we're playing the first single on, on and I panicked and I probably just went like, I, I don't want to drop a drumstick, you know? And I think I remember I, I wasn't secure that I could play traditional and get, you know what I mean? And get the power. So I would occasionally I just grab them, you know? And later Greg's taught me the, the, the beauty of grab and match grip, which is you can actually, it, I think it helps to know that you have the rebound ability and that we've learned a little semi-control. Like once you understand that semi-control is actually really is control that you can now match grip isn't quite as restrictive it used to feel like i felt a little chunky with it but now i realize oh yeah you can you, you can free it up i still can't quite i greg can play a beautiful double stroke roll triple stroke roll he can play any rudiment he wants matched or traditional i can't but i can now fumble some pretty nice i can i enjoy i enjoy both but yeah what gene taught me was um the, the beauty of uh, the, the, the shadow beats. You know, he, inadvertently he taught me that there's all this space that you can subdivide between one and two. There's all this one, there's another two, there's another two, and it's like, it'll keep you, it can keep you rolling forward. It doesn't have to be metronomic, although it will ultimately. And he also, I, I think, I think what I, you know, I, thought, I see a lot of drummers do that. Their left foot is, in motion on the hat, even because they're they're um they're they're cutting time up with it all. They're just creating. Yeah, you're. It's like you want to, you like Henley says, you can live and die in a slow song between one, two. Like you can live and die in that. Yeah. It's like so if you you subdivide and you play games. Sometimes I play with my teeth. I'm beating on my teeth. You know I'm. I'm uh, you know, I'm probably tearing my mouth apart because I'm, I'm trying to get those extra gears to click for me. And it, and I think Bardo showed me where those gears were. I don't know if he knew he was doing it, but like the rudiments, they teach you that. They teach you that, wow, there's all this crazy stuff that can happen if it's with muscle memory. Like yeah. sometimes, you you know, as a kid, I'd watch my, I remember I, you know, when the first time you learned how to play a really good double stroke roll or paradiddle and your friends would marvel. It was like you were playing a card trick. Right. You know, it's like, look what I can do. And it's like, you go, how do you do that? And you like, yeah, after a point, you're going, I don't really know. It's like, it's, it's sort <laughs> I of went happening. to the Louis Belson clinic once, and one of the greatest lines I've ever heard is every rudiment is nothing more when you break it down than a single or a double, like rolls or doubles, single stroke roll, paradiddle, single and a double, flat, right. two singles, everything singles and doubles. 
That's a pretty cool. That's like the guy that says, yeah, every kind of music, it's either straight or swan. It's either da 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 or it's da da da. Every kind of music, classical, Indian, bhangras, you name it. You know, they're straight or swan, singles or doubles. Well, the great night you took me to see Belson at the Catalina. And um, he came over to our table and introduced, you know, it, Greg knew him. And so I got an introduction as Greg's friend, which was perfect. You know, I got, I have a reason to meet Louis Belson. And he, and we were sitting there and he played a, a double stroke role. I have to tell the story because it was a gorgeous, it was this elegant double. And it was just, it was a press role that just went beautifully and it just never ended. And then of course it ended right where we we're supposed to. And then he came um, to the table and I said something like, that was just a hell of a press roll. And he said, um, I think the quote was, he looked at Greg and he goes, you try to make it sound like you're tearing paper. Right, right. And, and then I, and I said something like, I'm trying to be really glib. And I went, well, you tore up the whole LA Times tonight. And he goes, um, and he looks up and he goes, I'm still working on it. Oh, Louie. And that was the day that Jeff Recaro passed away. Yes, it was. But I remember thinking, here's a guy at his point in station in life, he's still teaching and he's still learning. And I thought that, that is, that's living baby. You know? So, I mean, it was like, cause yeah, he, he owed us nothing. He owed nobody yeah. at the table, anything. We could have just, he could have just said, Hey, buy me a drink and I'll, you know, but he yeah. was like, I want to tell you guys how hard I work at this, how much yeah. I love it, what there is to know. And he was like, yeah. And he looked good doing it. He looked good. And when I told him, I said, I, I read a quote where Duke Ellington said, of all the drummers he had, you were his favorite drummer. And he said so humbly, Duke was drinking a lot in those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, boy, just to be able to be in that that's some rarefied air when they start talking about drumming for Duke Ellington. And, and I'm, like I said, that was a night, I think Myron was there. Myron was there. Yep. The three of and, us. Um, but I remember thinking, boy, am I at a, I'm at the, I'm at a, I'm at a hell of a table here. You know, this is, this is quite a table, you know. What do you guys think makes a great drum track? Stan. He is a producer as well as a drummer. This guy's produced so many great Don Henley albums and other albums here. From a producer's standpoint and a drummer's standpoint, that's a stand question. Well, uh, okay. It, what really, okay. I mean, for me, what really makes a drum, great drum track is if it makes you move. If it moves, if it, I mean, there's no real technical term for feel other than feel. And there's no better way to describe groove than groove. And it's um so, really what what makes a great drum track is if it serves this it serves the song and this and your um and the singer gets turned on i mean these are what i'm thinking off the top of my head your singer is is got is got a hex on him because your groove has just made it so he can phrase and he can go and and it's it turns that song from a just a a piece of something to read into something that you got to hear again and again. And this is where you get down to your Charlie Watts and your Ringo and you get down to it. You get down to the nitty gritty for me, for rocking. You know, I know there's other ways beyond this, but you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing's going to turn you loose like a, you know, honky tonk woman or, or help, you know, or like, you know, just these songs that just, if you pull the drums out, yeah, they're still great, but without the infection of a great drum track, it's like, it's, it's nice. It's nice. It's a good demo. Cool. Stan and I share another favorite drummer. I mean, well, first of all, Charlie, like what Stan's talking about, like when, when you heard Honky Tonk Woman on the radio, the first thing you hear is that cowbell. drum group like Stan says it makes you move but there's another guy and he's not talked about enough in drumming circles and his name is Simon Kirk oh yeah oh. and you know we know Simon from Free and Bad Company but you ask 
like for instance, I teach lessons, a lot of college kids like USC, Cal Lutheran, Cal State Northridge, they come over and I go, you know, play all right now. And they don't play, you know, they don't play the quarter notes. They play an eighth notes. I said, no, it's quarter notes. And when I asked Simon about that, he said, well, that was like take 40 and my hand was tired. So I went with quarter notes and it worked. But it makes Stan and I, and I know you, you mm-hmm. too, Steve, because we all have the same influences. It makes us move. It, it, oh, yeah. reminds, it reminds you of where you were when you heard All Right Now come on the radio. It, so it, that's, well, I couldn't agree more, Stan. Well, it, it's, there's a, um, I know it sounds corny probably to even say it, but there's a real sexiness in a good drum track. It's like it, it conjures like all the cool things in life. Like, you know, when you hear, and, and Simon's so deep, like it's even like a track like Mr. Big, where he's like, even, he goes even further than, like he goes, and then, and it's like, that's all I need to know about Simon Kerr. If he, if he walked away after just doing that, I go, aha. And on okay, that point, to that point, when I asked Stan, how he came up with the groove on breakdown with the uh, uh, he said i just went for ringo in my life and put Absolutely. a shuffle on it right Stan? that's it that's it and then there was uh, i remember i was trying it was that stop dragging uh my heart around you right. know um there's right. a you yeah. go you know da, 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 and it goes ting ting to the brow yeah and I, I i was in my head i'm doing simon kirk doing the intro to mr big do the brow and because I every time I went and saw Free, he do to brat was like I couldn't believe that like a drummer was so cool to not go do to brat, you know, like right. but he just went like his foot did the heavy lift. And I right. thought, well, I'm consider that stolen. And I must have tried that lick in every song ever. And I finally got it in that one record, and I was like so proud of myself i must have played it for every drummer buddy and like they're all looking at me going like oh yeah little, little simon jr you finally got it in there didn't you you know it's like so but yeah what makes a great drum track that i think i, I i've ex- now greg will tell you what really makes a great drum and, track. I, and on that youtube video of stop dragging my head around i remember that your headphones blew up you're like whoa What's going on? Do you remember that scene? What was that all about? I don't remember. I did probably some it, it, headphones were always blowing up. So was that, was that when you were tracking when you YouTube that song? Was that was no? That, that was a different. There was a little different tune, but to a different point. What 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 do you what what makes a great drum track for you? Like when you're playing one. I don't want to be the cop out guy here, and I know we have a lot of questions, but let's move on to the next one because okay. that nailed right. it. That's exactly. What I think, 110 percent. Okay. And help and honky tonk woman and in my life and you know breakdown and stop dragging my head around. Game over. Well, there, you guys brought up the free record because I've been listening to Fire and Water like constantly for like the last oh. month. That whole album's blowing me away. I got I got to see those guys a lot when I was a kid. I was so lucky. They were the opening act for the Faces, which was another one of my favorite bands. Yeah. So I free in the Faces. I would follow. I would hitchhike to Tampa to go see them, you know, when I was 15 and 16, just to go, you know, I'd be like outside the stadium, even if I couldn't get a ticket, just to, just to watch, you know, to go like, Oh my God, these, these are, these are real blood and guts rock and roll bands. Absolutely. You know? Did you ever see Simon live with bad company? Oh yeah. Several times. In oh Tampa? yeah. What's that? In Tampa? No, no. Bad Co was all, I was already living in LA. I saw him at the forum. First time I saw him, you know, Simon was, he was the epitome of a beautiful Nordic macho. You know, he came out, I think they opened with Bad Company. The first thing he did was when he walked out of stage, he took his shirt off. Ah! And I thought, well, there you go. Daddy's <laughs> home. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, Love okay, it. we're in for a night. We're in for a blistering evening. You know, I think you I saw I saw, him, saw him at St. Augustine recently. It was so sweet right before the show. I just said, hey, I just want to let you know, I'm real excited to see the show. And he goes, oh, great. A drummer in the audience, he goes, I gotta be on me game tonight. There and he was, goes, Dan. And he did, boy, he put on a clinic for me that night. I mean, just beautiful stick twirls and just all the it was it was yeah, he put on I mean, I just walked away from that just going, Oh, you you bastard. Yeah, you know, you've and gotten sick. You were good and now you're better, you know. No, no kidding, man. 
And right up there with signature drum grooves are signature drum fills. And Stan already nailed the one, Simon Kirk Dugublop, but the other one that I know guys our age can totally relate to. One, two, ba-da, doo da go ba Oh, yeah. Come on, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Signature fills, man. Wow. And, what's so, and what's so cool about it is you know that that's what he really wanted to do. It wasn't like he charted it or he, he just goes, this, and it might have been on the take previously, it might have been very different or it might have been slightly different. Or, But right. this is what he needed to get the band. He had to call muster on him. Yeah. He like had to reel him in, like, come on, boys, I'm one, yeah. two, one, two. But, you know, it's like yeah. you can feel him reel in that band, like saying, here's the energy we're going to sink back on that one with. Here's what we're coming back with, you know. Yeah, and that's what a big long extended guitar solo that starts with a bass solo. Beautiful. But here we go, Pat. I love that stuff. We all drummers love that. We love that moment where you're like the, the band leader. You really are. You know, it's yeah. like it's a beautiful thing. My, my grandmother once asked, "How you're in, a, in the band?" She came and saw the band. She said, "How do you play without a conductor?" Ah. <laughs> She's symphonic. You know, my yeah. grandma was a symphony woman, yeah. you know, and and I said, like, you know, I never really thought about it, but I think we maybe sometimes I'm that guy. And I said, sometimes the singer is that guy when he turns around and calls the band because he's feeling it that way tonight. And, you know, and, you, and sometimes it's a 13 bar blues. And if the singer right. forgot to come in, it's right. You know, so we she said must be terribly confusing without a conductor. And I thought, what an interesting perspective, you know, right. That's that something that reminded me, Stan, you guys backed up Bob Dylan at one point, who's notorious for just changing direction. Oh, um, yeah. How did you follow that? Were you watching him like a hawk every instant he was on stage? Or was there... Closest, like I've, ever, closest I've ever experienced to playing jazz. And I mean that in the kindest, and I mean that in a beautiful and an honest way. Um, I would be halfway through a song, not halfway. I'd be a minute into a song before I knew what it was. It was great. I'd go like, cause he would start, you know, it, it, it was wonderful. It would be like, you know, it just start with this reggae. I didn't even know where one was. I just hear, and, 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 and I just assumed it would be, mm, and, 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 but I could have been dead wrong. So you just put your foot down and you, and then you see Bob kind of look around like, Whoa, didn't see that coming or, and, and, you know, and then you realize, Oh, we're playing, Masters of War as a reggae song tonight, or we're playing Lay Lady Lay as a, as a Ramon song, literally. I mean, at, at one point he looked over, I, I, this, true, he looked at me one day and he goes, what's so Stan, this is the middle, you know, some giant gig. Stan, what do you want to play tonight? I said, let's try something we haven't done. I, I said, I, we haven't tried Lay Lady Lay. I don't think I've ever heard that. He goes, great. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, boy, I'm going to get my baby gad going tonight i'm gonna show him what i got so the first thing he does he just launches into it as and i'm not exaggerating as a full-on ramones I, I he started a song i go what is that oh first he asked me what key is it in so i'm going like uh and you know campbell's in the background going hey please make it an a you know like so i'm going like hey he goes okay and then he goes like i'm going <laughs> it's like I'm going this is far out so that's the courage I mean some people probably thought of it as weird or I thought it was incredibly courageous I was just and this went on for years we did a couple of years where I every night was a you know like pull I don't know it's going to be great and you do it in at RFK stadium you know what I mean like the the, the cojones on that fella you know and um and, and and a good band, you know, like thank God for guys like Mike Campbell and Ben Montench who can read his mind and know they know every song ever recorded. And because you know, for the drummer's point of view, it's almost like see in four minutes if I can just establish a groove. Like I'm not going to overstate my case in, in case you know you never wanted to be the guy to launch into a fill thinking Bob's going to go there. He can make a complete fool of you if you did. So I just learned like. Oh, he's actually looking. This might be the chorus. I'll just play. Not, you know, I'm never going to be the guy that goes, and here it comes, because you're just going to, he'll, he'll, he would love that. Nothing more than to throw you under a bus. You know what I mean? And, 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 and I think it would, it would be either intentional or, 
or just because he just didn't care. He didn't care. What so my theory was as a drummer was just if I can just find the pulse, watch the watch, you know, for like for a few minutes and then try to see if I can get everybody to settle down, you know, like just, and then if, and if you don't, and the other thing is when a situation like that too with the drummer and Greg will probably back me up is sometimes the drummer's job can be just to create the hypnosis because other people might not know what to play. And it, they may just find that the best thing to do is do nothing. If you're playing that good and the singer's singing, drum beat, vocal, we've almost got us a record going. You know, we've almost Amen. got a record. I so, agree. I mean, yeah. I, I used to make that mistake and try to overstate my case all the time. And I remember having uh, Mike look at me one day and I said, I said, why aren't you playing? And he said, well, I'm just waiting for it to get good. Ah. Ah. And I thought to myself, well, he kind of called BS on me because he's basically saying, you're not playing any, you're not rolling out a red carpet for me yet. Like all I hear is a bunch of yickety splackety, yickety splackety. You know, and it's like what he needed to hear was just, would you just carpet bomb me with a beautiful pulse? And then I can find my way in on this, you know, and that that was an interesting lesson, you know, and also learning to play other instruments is very helpful to making you a better drummer. I really believe that if you've even tried to play the bass, I'm not saying you have to be accomplished. If you've tried to play the piano, if you have sat down and tried to sing or sing along is the other way to, if you want to play a good drum track, put a, put a lyric sheet in front of your face and learn the song. If you really want to be in the band, um, learn to sing this, you know, like you'll never probably sing it, but I found some of the best tracks I ever got with in a band situation where when I'm singing along, Right. Because then I realized it's not really about me. It take, also takes a lot of pressure off. Like, yeah. bass from part B, boom, ba boom, boom, or boom, ba boom, boom, or boom, ba boom, boom. Like, screw it. The song is just doing this and then generally sorts you out. Like, if you get to the part where you're in a rock and roll song, if you can sing and play drums, you're a lyrical drummer and you're probably helping out. You're probably helping the cause. And you and I both stand. We both sing a lot of harmonies on gigs. I know you're going to see you. You're most of the harmonies I heard from you. Well, that, that, I think that kind of keeps you in the, it keeps you in the band, not just playing the drums. I think that's a big mistake. A lot of drummers play the drums and they should play the song and they should be in the band. And um, the drums are great. Don't, no, I'm not knocking it. God, you know, the, <laughs> thank you drums for the roof over my head and the car I drive and the food I eat, you know, but to be, to play a song requires a, a certain selflessness that right. you, um, it's hard to do. It's hard for a young man to do unless you have good mentors. And I think a good mentor, a good producer can always help a young drummer by just reminding him you're, you're one gear, you're one of these big gears. And if you come out of place and make, bring too much attention to yourself, the sprocket really is is not going to work, and but that's a those are hard fought lessons, and usually you learn those after you've heard yourself back on the radio, or you know, uh, you know, a song gets embedded that you've worked on, and you hear it for years, and you kind of go like, "What an idiot!" You you start calling yourself out. You go, "What was I thinking with that?" What song can you think of that you don't dig your drum part? Oh, Greg, I, on, I, give me one, just one, because I dig them all. Come on, I can embarrass myself. I can always think there's not a one that I can't tell it, you could that I could go. Yeah, he sure went for broke on that one. Didn't American he? girl. Well, well, that's that's all. Well, the only reason Come I can on. say well, it's me trying to play Bo Diddley and failing miserably. No, and, no, and so, no, 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 um, no. It's you kicking butt, man. That's oh, a oh, Greg. track. You're being way too charitable. What it is, I am is not. You're, See, no, you're not. You're me. I'll back me up here. That's, that's no. Awesome. I mean, I can think of a lot of fills that are so signature to you, Stan. That I don't heard. I've never heard anybody else do. Just like on the intro to uh, um, coming to my mind now. Um, that good, huh? Yes, yeah, that great. <laughs> uh, Losers, you got that crazy fill in the middle of that thing where you hit the symbol. Well, mistake number D. That was um. Uh, okay, that's that was. I wish I could. 
that was a cl that's a clutch clutch bone move because between takes I decided there was a time where sh Jimmy Iovine wanted he described the band as and I quote um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers it's the it's the guy with the cold the twelve string and the big tom toms. <laughs> I mean, man, what a piece of work. So there's the band's description. So as a result, I had two rack toms briefly because he wanted tom toms. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm really trying. I've tried the double tom thing up front. I was just terrible at it. Plus, I could never get the right symbol anywhere where I could even get it close to me. So between takes on Even the Losers, I had taken the, the second rack tom and removed it and brought the symbol in. So I think you see where I'm going here. Yeah. So the song, there's a place in the song where it's like, and I'm taking it, I'm making a, I'm playing drummer's diarrhea. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just playing my, my butt off, you know, not knowing anything because it's all about me at this point, you know, I'm, <laughs> and, uh, and it comes to the place in the song where it goes, something falls apart. And I, I was going to go, home, bing. But what happened was, as I closed my eyes, I went but in a ting because there was no Tom Tom there. Ah. ah, so I thought for sure the whole thing was going to erupt into hysterics at this point. You know, that's how quickly things are going through the drummer brain, you know, but a ding, I go like, I almost probably put my sticks down and was too, just a millisecond from going like, ah! you know, well, nobody noticed. And the next thing I knew, we were stampeding into the choruses out and I, we went in for the playback and I remember it's like the, you know, this, the take was over and Tom goes, felt pretty good. want to hear that one. And so we go in and listen and I'm thinking like, Oh, sh when it comes to this, I'm, I'm done. There's a pink slip right coming up. And uh, it went right by. Nobody said a thing except Campbell looked at me and he goes, kind of weird on that symbol that like, kind of weird on that one good luck with that or something like that like just kind of snot you know because we did that for each other all the time it was like yeah good luck with that one you know so he was the only guy that even i think he said good luck with that or something like that but it's a hook but it's it's a mistake well, let's be honest ringo was walking out of the studio and it was bright daytime when they went in and he came out and he was like gonna say man it's been a you know hard day at work and he goes been a hard day it's night and that became, right. that day became a song and so did even the loser symbol film well there was a ton of that in my early in the early first couple records i was just playing to, to just to stay in my lane you know i was so out of my depth i'm in a recording studio with a with denny cordell who's a great producer he's famous i'm 19 20 years old i'm just scared out of my brain pretty much the first two records that I'm gonna and Jim Keltner's hanging around Jim Gordon's hanging around they're all part of the shelter you know the, what studio? this is called the brown room at shelter it was basically a demo it was a funky it was a hellhole that we had moved from Tulsa Leon Russell's studio it wasn't when I say studio it was on a second floor of a like an all adult bookstore you know what I mean yeah, it was yeah. like I mean it was a this is funky stuff the first two records are really funky what drums and what's that what drums were you using oh it was a hybrid i had uh, the thermogloss kick and i had my little baby gretch uh jaspers i think i had a 12 and a 14 i was always trying i was fishing around but we we had like three microphones for the drum kit and one the, the drum the drums on american girl are on one track wow really? three microphones put on one track wow so, I mean, it's almost the first couple records are, I won't say demo, and the producer and engineer were, were um, they took two had tips, they took two hits of acid every day, every day. It was religion. And they wanted us to do it too. And they'd forever take a flash camera and put it in your face and go, go through the window. You know, they were, they were wild. I once asked like why my bass drum sounds so crappy. And he goes, your bass drum is like a giant elephant trying to run through a mouse hole. You know, so, you know, think of the symbols as green grapes. I mean, literally, I'm not making this crap up. I mean, this is the people we were running with for the first two years. Our rock band was as, as was, um, 
it was right out of some kind of like weird zap comic book thing, what we were doing the first, you know, we were, we were rednecks in space, you know? <laughs> so yeah, my whole drug, everything, you know, the, the, the plan. Yeah. You gotta be kidding me, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it sure worked. I, I, I'm very grateful. I'm extremely grateful. Well, you said earlier that it wasn't a drum set that you could buy. You just had to start with a drum and yes. buy a drum, new or used. What was that drum? The first thing you bought was a snare drum? Probably. Well, yeah. Uh, the first snare drum I bought was, I think, was probably a slingerland with a claw, claw hoop. Like it was a du du duo, no, duco. You know, three paints all chipped funky i remember i just i would set it up in the corner i had a billy gladstone pad on it and i just i just stare at it it was so beautiful it was like you a thing of it? beauty no i wish i did i probably probably stripped the finish off of it thinking i could do something and you know i you know and then uh then i think finally after like four years of drum lessons my dad bought me a um the beginning of a uh not the club date what was the one below it um Shoot, uh, the one was the single monologues. Ludwig. No, it was a uh, it was a Ludwig kit, but it only had one. No, the club. Oh, I already said. It, I keep thinking it's a club date, but it was a, the downbeats were the ones above the club date. That's the Ringo the, kit, the downbeat. That's what I have now today, but the old one was the club date. Okay. And my dad bought me a three piece club date. And it had a, uh, but it had a, um, a jazz fest snare, which was really nice, yeah. but I didn't have a floor tom. So I, I just had, I had three matching pieces. Like that was like, wow, I have pictures of that kid. And it's still, I remember like that, that kid, I just would stare at, I go to bed with my flashlight on it, you know, and looking at the Ludwig catalog all night, you know, I mean, I was that kid, you know. I just, I'd turn on the, I'd wake up at two in the morning, just put my flashlight on my drum set and be like, oh my gosh, you know, it says like, just like, just like Ringo's does, you know? Yeah. For the kids out there, before you settled on Tupelo Honey, you had a couple other names for this kid that were cracking me up. Are you, do you want to divulge them or do you want to save them for the next round? I don't even remember. I honestly, they, they oh. shot to me. Steve, remember? Yeah, they were fun. We had a fun time making those up. Um, we had one uh, double cask. Oh, always a good one. One of my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, we had Blonde Bombshell. Blonde Bombshell. Well, a little, little in politically correct for today. Yeah, yeah. But we had fun making those names up. Although well, I we won't give them all away because you never know when the next... Uh, well, I could have been talking about Brad Pitt. Say that again? I, blonde Bombshell could have been Brad Pitt. You never <laughs> know. <laughs> could have been Brad Pitt, baby. <laughs> Let's switch a little direction. Sorry, we're not we're not answering any of your questions. No, you kind of are in a roundabout way. It's fine. Um, let's talk about uh, something different here. Stan, Stan how did you become a songwriter? Uh, kind of at gunpoint, you know. It was like um, I, I I was finding myself in in need of something to do. I like we certainly didn't need it in the band. We had a couple real good ones. But um, I was finding that I needed something to keep myself busy and occupied. So I started just, and I always, I'd always done it kind of like in the bands in Florida when I was growing up, you know, we'd write original and it would be awful, you know, we'd, and then uh, in California, I met up with a couple other guys that were wanting to write. And my break was, um, was Don Henley. Uh -huh. that was, Not a bad break. No, it was a great break. And um, it was Danny Korchmeyer, who was Don's producer and brilliant guitar player and songwriter. Uh, we met socially, I believe. And um, and one day he just, he I literally, I think he said something to the effect of, you know, you're funny, you ought to write this down. And I was like one of those, like, I didn't tell him I'd already been through two publishing deals and failed miserably. But he said something like, you know, if you got anything for this track, Don's working on a song, we, we, uh, he doesn't have anything. And he played me um, a track and said, go home with it and write, start writing. And I'm thinking, well, this will go nowhere. This is never gonna happen. And then the next thing I knew, he said, um, I think I got a call, you know, Henley said, come up to the house, show me what you got. And it was like, 
well, this is a put up or shut up, nut up or shut up kind of moment, you know, like, um, so I went to Don's house and proceeded to show him my legal pad full of ideas. And, um, and he was ex extraordinary. I mean, he would, the first thing he did is he took out his red pencil and Mark threw up lots and lots of it and said, your spelling is horrible, corrected all my spelling and um, said, you know, you really should read more. Um, and he suggested immediately like six or eight good books to send, and he sent me home with them. He, you know, he was a mentor brilliantly right on the spot, but he said, here's what I like. Here's what, this is good. This is going to work. And he said, sit down and, and, and knock this thing out with me. And, uh, and it was like, it was one of those surreal moments where you go, I've always wished that this would happen, but oh my God, this is happening and I'm not prepared. Was but, it Heart of the know, Matter, Last Word this evening? What was no, it? it was, a, it was a, a song that made it on, um, I can't remember, it was called Driving With Your Eyes Closed. And it's on, um, is it the second Don record? I think it is. Uh, and then it was, and you know, I, I had fun ideas, you know, for things to, to do. And, and we, we, we became friends, you know, and that's for certain collaborations, it's required that you be able to know and trust each other. Certain colla other collaborations are purely, um, they're very businesslike. I've experienced, you know, writing in Nashville and, you know, I've, I've been doing it, you know, I've been through many, many years of publishing deals in Nashville writing. They're very, uh, you don't even have to introduce yourself. It's like, what do you got? Let's get, you know, we know what the stakes of the game are. And then there's certain writers where it's a very, uh, it's personal, you know, you have to, be prepared to embarrass yourself. And, um, and Don taught me so much. And Danny Korsmeyer too, about, look, just do it, just do it. And it's like, we'll, we'll decide later if this is any good. But, and, and, and getting to audit certain people's process is so, it's just like, what, if, you, if you're in a room and, and Greg Bisson is playing drums, you probably only need to sit down and shut up and sit in the corner, ask a couple questions, but mostly just audit the process. If you're watching Greg cut a track, for instance, you don't need to say like, and where do you put your ankle? You know, it's like, you just like, let me just take a lot of mental notes and images and pictures of this. So where Can I, I learned- say something real quick about what you just said? Hmm. Stan says, hey, man, what are you doing like tomorrow around three? And I was at the NAMM show playing with Spinal Tap, right? right. So I go, well, we don't start till eight. So I could I could be at Royal Tone at three. So yeah. I'm at Royal Tone and using your kit that's there or Don's kit. Right. That Jeff Chone has brought. And I look in the control room and there's two of my favorite drummers, two of my heroes, Stan Lynch and Don Henley. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, you talk about pressure. And so Don throws out, because Stan had told Don that I went to North Texas State. Well, Don went to North Texas State, and Don was an English major, you know. And um, anyway, so he says, yeah, why don't you play something like, maybe like a Ohio, Earth, Wind, and Fire. No, no, not Earth, Wind, and Fire. Maybe like Ohio players meets like reggae and throw in some like North Texas jazz stuff. And you did. Stan's feeding Don all this stuff, and I can see them talking and laughing. And it ends up, I play this, and Stan's like, well, what about if you do some of that high-ass stuff? And Don says, yeah, do the backbeat. And then, oh, oh, oh. Sure, we can all do that. <laughs> What's that now? Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I know those are those moments where you're thinking to yourself, I really can't believe this is happening. I don't know if I'm ready for this kind of, I don't know if I want, you know, it's like, those are wonderful moments that happen in a, yeah, but we were both knocked out. Don's, Don thinks the world of this and that. I mean, he just, he knows, he every, everybody knows. It's like, it's, yeah, but those are great moments when you're, 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 you're in over your head, but it's like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm in over my head. So mostly, yeah, but, but the writing thing has become, it's really all, it's second nature now. And I really love it. And it's, just, it passes for my social life. You know, when I get together with buddies and we can write and we can enjoy it 
and the, and the stakes of the game are are pretty they've been reduced now at this point in my life where it's kind of enjoyment first you know and, and freedom you know and then uh then let's see if we can come up something competitive you know or did something you challenging when, all by yourself or did you collaborate that with tim back when oh no that's a that's a nashville session that's a nashville writing session so you it's, and uh, people? yes those those are nashville writers it's all nashville tim i don't tim didn't we never that song was sent through publishing people to him it was like I, I only heard back from my publisher that Tim's cutting your song. Was it your song, not a bunch of writers? It was no, your it was actually, it was uh, three of us. It was Jeff Stevens, Stephanie Smith, and myself. We all got together. It's almost like they're all blind dates. Get together and write. And somebody goes, what do you got? Oh, sorry, time to go. <laughs> Just to wrap up, uh, I'd like to review everything we talked about. Uh, we talked with Stan today about his joining Dixon drums and his drum kit. And want to thank you again for this this wonderful session we had with you and Greg. It was fantastic talking to you guys. Well, well thank you for, the, for bringing me on board to the family. And thank you for all the guidance, Greg, for building this kit and the design. Thank you for making it all happen. The international effort required in this day and age to get a drum set out to the middle of the state of Florida, you know, from, <laughs> from continents away is amazing. And uh, I really can't believe my good fortune in having this uh, th this opportunity to have new friends and have a great new kit. And uh, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure working with you on this. It's been a really great, fun collaboration, and I've enjoyed every step of it with you. So I want to thank you again. And thank you, Greg, for jumping on today and hanging out with us. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. And what a blast to hang out with two of my great friends and talk about drums and talk about the coolest guy, the new addition to the wonderful Dixon family, my longtime friend, and one of my drumming heroes and pals, Stan Lynch. What an honor. Thanks, man. Really, really appreciate it.